Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to another in our series of Communities Chest. Communities Chest, as you know, is where we uh, try and get somebody from within the many communities of Zien, the FS Club, Long Finance, and others, to give us some thoughts and opinions on the topics of the day and uh, a bit of you know how they're living their life. And today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by one of our dearest and oldest friends, uh, Patrick Young. Uh, Patrick, uh, just uh, before we get cracking, where are you calling in from? Good day, Michael. I'm speaking to you today from the ancient capital of Malta, Valletta. I'm sitting actually in a Maltese balcony, which is one of those wonderful things, often in green, which are bestrewn across the lovely sandstone buildings of this fine country. Well, Patrick, if you just lean uh, to the to your right a bit, then the audience can have a bit look out of your balcony. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Hey, wow. So. And actually, I can lift that a little bit and hopefully you can see the sea. You can well, see you the sea, so. which is our half sea view that you can get from behind. And it's it's quite beautiful. I mean, it really is. It's a magnificent uh, sunny post Easter day here. And uh, the folks have gone back to work, but it's hopefully reasonably quiet because it's gone lunchtime. And therefore, we'll be able to have a chat with all of these excellent communities that you run, Michael. And is, uh, are things in Valletta pretty much the way they are here in London, the, really in lockdown and people are staying at home? Slightly different. We have lockdown, but it's not a full lockdown. So everyone can still go out. You can walk, you can exercise. Again, it's the same sort of thing where two's a company, three's you know, a minor felony. But overall, we can get out with the dog, for example, at any time of the day. You can go shopping, although, frankly, everybody delivers in this country, so we get most stuff delivered. Um, it's slightly sunnier and slightly less stringent, certainly, than, say, Derbyshire from reading the UK tabloids recently. <laughs> uh, that's under normal, under normal circumstances. Anyway, um, you and I agreed a, a sort of a little format that we're going to go through today. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to give people a little bit of background. There was a chat note for all of you, and please uh, do feel free. Uh, to check out Patrick's uh, video, which is really uh, a good uh, one-minute hoot. Um, but Patrick, you're one of the few people who I, I love quoting, uh, and this is a quote from you. Uh, the trouble with weather forecasting is that it's uh, right too often for us to ignore it and wrong too often for us to rely on it. Uh, and it's, of course, it's not hard to find quotes from you because you're everywhere. You are ubiquitous, but you're also a prolific author. Uh, and I actually love this. Uh, uh, I think we met sometime around the time you were producing uh, the Capital Market right. Revolution, which was a fascinating book and extremely uh, well received. Um, a lot of people would say oh, it was obvious, but it wasn't so obvious back then, was it? No, I mean, that's the key thing is, like everything in hindsight, the, the, the trick to having written a book that has ultimately got longevity is the fact that it looks really obvious. But at the time, there were really only quite literally a few hundred people who were really looking in the same direction. You were one of them, Michael, at all points in time. And, you know, this was written about fintech. It's the first best-selling book of fintech, and yet it comes out 10 years before anybody appended the word fintech to the whole concept. And you can see here, this is Toby, my co-star from IPO Video, who is having an assiduous read while he was checking in on what was going on. And... Oh, well. And one of the great things about about that book, not not, not just in terms of establishing a fintech, uh, but was uh, you were also uh, predicting that uh, it was going to be a revolution that was different than others. This wasn't a, a Shakespearean revolution that they'd be you know lined up against the wall. Uh, it was much more uh, the idea that we, things were going to be shaken up in all sorts of different ways, um, but many people would survive. Well, actually, that's true. And in many ways, that's the bit that was wrong in the book, because we didn't see a massive international upheaval revolution against government because people wanted to do things in a more digital way. In fact, if we look at it, the world is incredibly similar. So it's quite fascinating because maybe now we're reaching something like the denouement where you're starting to see the digital world really take off. And at the same time, those people who are analog can be left behind. And I suppose in a way, what's interesting is just to think about it. Look at the politicians we've had for the last 20 years. I'm not going to pick on any one person. Look at the whole cast. 
and they're not actually very digital. And I think that's a that's a key issue that probably has slowed the overall revolution down at the top end. Whereas from the bottom up, fintech has certainly been changing a lot of the ways that we do business in the city and the way people look at their finances. Well, we'll come to politicians in a moment, but uh, I was wondering, you might want to say a word or two about uh, another one of your books, The World's Most Influential People, and how predictive was that? Well, actually, that's been not too bad. I mean, that, that's really more a review book, per se. It's the 1,000 people who are most important in the world's financial market structure. There's going to be a new edition of that coming out later this year. This one was from 2017. And leading the world is really the greatest entrepreneur in the history of the exchange business. He's also, I think, in many ways, the greatest manager in the history of the exchange business, which is Jeffrey Sprecher, the man who started with the Intercontinental Exchange as a tiny power exchange, which he basically bought for a dollar and assumed a million dollars in debt and turned it into a $50 billion company 20 years on, owning the New York Stock Exchange. He's at number one. The great thing about this book, I think, is it includes everybody. So if you're the chairman of the Bulgarian Stock Exchange, you get to be in this book. And it shows the fact of who are the people that are actually making a difference to the world of market structure because by day I produce this newsletter Exchange Invest which is the pithy daily read of everybody who's in the exchange business from the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange and the chief executive of Nasdaq down. Well uh, that I think leads us on uh, kind of nicely to uh, your latest book which uh, we were pleased you launched uh, last year with us at the Guildhall Library in London. Uh, and that was a, also a, a very interesting read. So, uh, victory or death, was it a victory? Well, so far we can't really tell. I mean, the victory is essentially more to do with how people themselves are going to cope with what's going on in the current environment. I mean fintech, I don't mean COVID. This was written before that. But the point is, you know, it's really about how people need to keep up with the digital struggle. They have to be on top of that. They have to understand not necessarily believe in Bitcoin. They need to understand what distributed ledger technology is doing, and they have to understand what are the major market models going forward, of which I would note, I mean, one of the great economic models of our time is really one of the oldest economic models of all, which is the model of the exchange. And, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, so one of the other things that I, I'm sort of kind of curious about here is that you have repeatedly uh, predicted the impact of finance, uh, sorry, of technology on finance. Uh, why does it seem to be, uh, as you remarked earlier, it still always feels a bit business as usual? Is that our perceptions of it and things have really fundamentally transformed or is it just a slow moving well, area? Let's put it this way, partially perception, partially reality. The perception is the fact that 20, 30 years ago, we were still using ATM. We were already using ATMs, rather. And I suppose people have somewhat seamlessly got into the world of phone banking, internet banking, and so on. And therefore, the iteration whereby you can't manage to do a transaction with your card that you're trying to swipe until you get an SMS message has just been taken on board. So in those senses, finance and fintech have really revolutionized a lot of things and reduced a lot of risk, which I think is very important for the whole system. On the other hand, if you look at something like, say, the bond market, you know, that 500 pound behemoth that James Carville, the, the great chief of staff to Bill Clinton famously wanted to be reincarnated as, there it's been incredibly slow progress. And really it's only in the course of the last year or two that we've seen entities such as Trade Web and Market Access becoming very, very, very significant market players in the overall transactions of bonds, which is incredible given the fact that they've actually been around since the time or before I wrote the book Capital Market Revolution in the first place. And I really expected they would have taken hold a lot faster. Why have they not taken hold? Of course, it's the old fashioned classic thing. The old oligopoly of the banks were very reluctant to give way, which is why, therefore, if you go and do your bond dealing in, say, Russia or Poland, you find that a huge amount of it takes place on an exchange. It's a much flatter market, much more open. You try and deal in U.S. treasuries. You try and deal in U.K. gilts, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that's still the preserve of the banks because it's been a huge profit center for many banks for many years. And understandably, banks are not in the process of just turning around and going, yeah, there's a profit center. I'll give it to you guys and let it be more efficient through technology. Life doesn't work that way. Mm. Well, we could spend a lot of time on your books. And so I challenged you to tell us uh, what's on your daily shelf and then maybe to talk about a, a few books that you're currently reading. So uh, uh, you, you listed these six websites as things that you go to 
every day. So do you want to pick out uh, one or two things from what you what you see saw this morning? Absolutely. So look, every day, because I did this newsletter exchange invest, we actually sift 50,000 websites daily, and that comes to me in one file. So that's the start of my day. The South China Morning Post is my daily go-to newspaper. I find it's a fantastically refreshing perspective. And if you're sitting, whether you're in the UK or Europe, it's absolutely amazing to see what's going on. Fabulous takeaway from the story in there today. The mall owners and office holders of Hong Kong are currently spending a great deal of money on robots and automated devices so that in this time of COVID-19, they can reduce the amount of human interaction and therefore they don't have to be so stressed. Of course, the interesting thing about that is what goes unspoken is, where are these people going to get jobs that are going to be replaced by the robots? But nonetheless, a great window on the Western world, a great window on the Far East, and a fascinating gateway into China for me every day as the South China Morning Post. City AM is my daily UK read because I think it very neatly encapsulates from the city of London out. I'm not suggesting that's the civilization perspective of all of the United Kingdom, but for somebody in finance and fintech like me, it's very much the way I tend to look. Monocle.com remains, I think, one of the most interesting print projects of the course of the last 20 years. I mean, Tyler Brule, who found a wallpaper, he's created a radio empire, which is always worth dropping into. He has this global, beautifully glossy magazine, and every day they have some interesting stuff comes up through their newsletter and their website, which really gives me some interest. The other guys, great for thought-provoking reading at all points in time, whether it's The Spectator spiked online for an alternative viewpoint, yeah. or CapEx, which comes from the Center for Policy Studies, to whom I've actually contributed a few times. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think there should be a seventh there, but you can't have it. So do you want to just tell the audience in uh, 15 seconds about uh, Exchange Invest, the newsletter, and how they can get sure. a hold of it? So, Exchange Invest newsletter is the daily newsletter of the Bourse business. It includes Pith from myself, PLY, those are my initials. We analyze over 50,000 news sources every day. We cover 500 plus different pieces of global financial market infrastructure. We're not afraid to manage to complain when things are bad, and we really love it when we can praise the market structure, as we have been able to do for the course of the last three weeks, because during COVID-19, exchanges, clearing houses, and settlement depositories have had their heads held high, and I'm delighted to see the success way that without barely a single technical hiccup, our parish, as we call it, of exchanges has been fully fulfilling what Exchange Invest stands for, which is to make better markets and better investment opportunities for people throughout the world. Ah. Now, you and I should really swap spa uh, places. Um, as you know, I'm a bit of a boat guy, uh, I, yeah. uh, and you uh, have got the, the sea behind you, and here I am in London, uh, and uh, you're a very much a car man, aren't you? Uh, so do you want to touch on a few of the uh, books that uh, we were we were going through before we move into sort of the meat of things? Absolutely. Look, my bookshelf is never the same without a couple of car, car books on it at all points in time. Actually, my entrepreneurial career started in my native Northern Ireland in uh, the 1980s when I was still at school. And I ran historic car racing, old car racing, a little tiny circuit called Kirkuston in those days. So Cars Accelerating the Modern World was a fascinating exhibition which was tragically cut short by COVID-19, all at the Victoria and Albert Museum recently. With their design flair, they produced a really, really stunning exhibition. And that's why this book is the book of the exhibit, which allows me to relive what has been a fascinatingly interesting experience. And I remain a passionate member of the Victoria and Albert because I think it's just one of the most brilliant experiences when you're in London for all kinds of design from start to finish. And that brings us to probably one of the greatest single name brands in the entire industry, Enzo Ferrari. Brock Yates, he's the guy that originally ran the Cannonball Run, for which many people will have seen the movie. He did it in the Ferrari Daytona in the early 1970s. Wonderful writer, very, very thoughtful man, but also a great expert in cars and discussing the myth and the legend of Ferrari is just the most incredible bedtime reading. Yeah. Well, fortunately, the, the third book you chose was something a little bit closer to me, but it does bridge it, the oil and the petrol that goes into the car. So uh, why is the frackers a good read? Look, the Frackers is a good read because Gregory Zuckerman knows how to tell a story. He brings in lots of different strands, so you're on tenterhooks throughout. The actual backstory is fantastic. You've got all of these sort of crazy wildcatter guys running around the world, well, running around America, trying to devise a better way to get oil and gas out of the ground that involves increasingly diagonal and then horizontal drilling bits. 
And these guys, quite literally, they go from being utterly penniless in many occasions to being billionaires almost overnight. And it's, a, it's just a super experience. Even if you don't believe in the use of oil per se, you really have to read this to understand. And of course, what's one of the big takeaways from the whole oil and gas business? Well, remember, long before anybody was talking about fracking, we actually had the first fracking war because Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait because he claimed that the Kuwaitis were using diagonal drill bits to effectively extract oil and gas from underneath the Iraqi territory and bringing it back over the Kuwaiti border. That's, that's a very interesting point, actually. And you chose a, a, another book as well. Uh, last week we had a, a webinar on the future of monetary uh, gold and silver with Alistair yeah. McLeod, and it seems that everybody's talking about gold. Now, that's not quite what you meant, I think, uh, when you were looking at the frontiers of fortune, but uh, why is this an important read for people? So, The Frontiers of Fortune was published by my good friend, Jonathan Story, who's a retired professor from INSEAD. It was published the same year as Capital Market Revolution, and I would firmly tell you this was the best book that Financial Times Prentice Hall published during the course of 1999. Not mine, Jonathan's book. Frontiers of Fortune is really a lot about the structure. So rather than purely about gold or silver or anything like that, Jonathan devises a way to analyze your way through how very complex systems are evolving and the point in time at which they may implode, explode, grow, or whatever. And the great example of that was he was teaching a summer school in the middle of 1986-1987 in INSEAD for leading CEOs from around the world and one American CEO of a Fortune 500 company demanded that Jonathan be immediately fired and they said well you know tenure or things like that we can't really do that and I'm sorry he's triggered you but we're not going to let him go. What was the problem? The problem was that Jonathan was doing the math and using this his own system, he looked at the Soviet Union and he said, it's very simple, within the next five years, maximum 10 years, the Soviet Union is going to implode. It cannot manage to survive any longer. And of course, as we know, it was only a couple of years later that we saw the roundtable talks in Poland giving way to free government there, and ultimately the collapse of the Berlin Wall later in the course of 1989. I think that's going to be one of the hardest things to explain to uh, children today or future generations. Yeah even today is the, the attitude. I, I was taking a course in uh, Trinity College Dublin in 1980, and it was on, uh, on the Soviet Union, and mm -hmm. our professor there, sadly deceased, was a genius. He spent his entire time forcing us to learn all these boring things about Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, yep. Siberia, and his whole thing was, you know, when the Soviet Union breaks up, not if, when it breaks up, you're going to need all of this to understand how to analyze it. And yep. uh, it was very, very prophetic. But we, we uh, to be honest, uh, we, we laughed at him. We, we thought, yep. well, it's, it's what we need to do to pass the course, but surely the Soviet Union will endure. And uh, he turned out to be quite right. Uh, I now, uh, so. sorry. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Nope, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, it's such an incredible thing, and it's impossible to manage to understand when you go to modern-day Berlin how that city that I went to as a kid in the mid-1970s was firmly divided up the middle and was genuinely, I mean, a civilizational divide and an economic divide. And these are things that you just cannot appreciate by going and getting your tourist picture taken at Checkpoint Charlie because you don't have the 150 meters of barbed wire either side and the plethora of tanks and armaments that were facing off to each other in a fashion and not unlike, say, the worldwide wrestling entertainment shows, but with a lot more serious might. Well, um, you know, talking about unexpected things, or potentially, here's uh, home working, you know, the, the subject that everybody's talking about. Uh, how is the, the, the current uh, gigantic global experiment with home working going, and what implications does it have for the future? Look, I think it's very interesting. I mean, I'm somebody who's been working on and off home working for years. In fact, I was in the early wave of the digital nomad movement. And one of these days, hopefully a gallery will allow me to actually exhibit all of the equipment we used to have to carry around to be a good digital nomad in 1994, 1995. So true. Because, you know, nowadays, everybody turns up and they set their, their Mac down and they go, OK, where's the Wi-Fi? I'm a digital nomad. Whereas I have literally just above this room, I mean, two full bags worth of technological oh, cables, equipment. And you used to spend excellent cables and plugs and you used to spend times and you used to know all of this sort of horrible, uh, it was like Sanskrit of tele telephony, you know, T1, P1, P1, T1, T1, XX, P1, T, to try and get the right pulse on your phone to connect to whose phone it was. So homeworking for me has become very much the norm. So I suppose I don't find it that different. But I agree. I think the biggest 
functional change that we're going to see is I do believe that there will remain very large, strong epicenters of finance and financial markets. But at the same time, I think a lot of people are going to go, do we really need the bulk of people right in the epicenter of the, you know, the square mile of the city of London? And let's face it, we know that that's been the case for 20, 30 years. I mean, you know, Chemical Bank, which is no longer with us, when they were around in the late 1980s and I was a broker, they were already trading out of uh, well, they were trading out of London, but they were actually doing all of their back office process in Swansea. The good folks of Invest NI, who I know are a great sponsor of the Financial Services Club, and I've been a huge supporter over the years from my native Northern Ireland. They've done very well by taking a lot of that back office business home. Yeah. Now we're probably at the next stage, which is we're going to take a lot of those people who are in the regions, get them to actually start working from home more often. And it won't be the death knell of the office, but it will certainly reduce how we interact with the office business. It's going to shrink the size of offices, and it's particularly going to shrink, I think, the size of this concept of, you know, hot desking, there'll need to be lesser capacity, and equally, actually meeting rooms. I mean, there's a really, really fascinating concept because, you know, meeting rooms originated effectively in the coffee houses of London where they built, you know, Lloyd's Insurance Market and out of Jonathan's they built the stock exchange and so on. And I can't help but feel that that's actually probably where we're going to go back to. Sooner or later, Starbucks will be back to having as many meetings as anywhere else because an awful lot of offices are going to downside and decide that a huge number of the meetings really aren't that important enough to hold within a very, very expensive, rented, rateable office building in the epicenters of New York or Tokyo or London or wherever. Mm. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a, a weird and strange plug for one of our sponsors, as you as you recall, Invest Northern Ireland. But one of the intriguing things there was we, we were having discussions over the last uh, three years with Brexit of people who were saying, well, I, I really don't want to be doubling up on my, particularly my regulatory compliance uh, divisions. Why don't I locate uh, in Belfast? And uh, then when I need to be in the EU, I can have people shifting between Belfast and my Dublin office, and I can therefore kind of cross the border at ease. And the reason for, for that was to be able to cross the border uh, with ease, but in, in the event of uh, an occurrence like the Icelandic volcano 10 years ago. So it was an interesting yeah. uh, an interesting comparison. Now, we've got a few it's questions coming in. It? Before it's I move, It's interesting to think, Icelandic volcano 10 years ago, everybody's completely forgotten it. And everybody's sitting around at the moment saying COVID-19, the world will never be the same. And it's interesting. I mean, this is bigger, but at the same time, it's incredible how we got back to reality and normality so quickly after that. Very true. But I don't I don't recall seeing the. I think it's the self-isolation bit that has been yeah, the, right. the big the big mover. Uh, now, a couple of questions here uh, about your books, believe it or not. I, what's going on here? People are interested. Uh, so one, one uh, quick question here. Does your book cover the movers and shakers in China in the market structure? Yes, it does. It covers everybody everywhere in the world. We analyzed over 500 different markets, exchanges, clearing houses, and settlement providers. And we've actually, the new edition, which is already in production, will be exactly the same. 1,000 people, and it is absolutely everybody anywhere in the world who has influence over financial market structure, including, it has to be said, some people who don't even work in exchanges, but may not be entirely benign towards them, such as, say, politicians who are trying to close them down or taper them or add transaction taxes to them. Uh, William Barkshire is a prolific questioner, and he's got a couple more here. Um, I'm going to wrap them up as one, or we'll be here all day. There are good questions here. Uh, but he's basically, what, what do you think COVID-19 is going to do? Is it the death of bricks and mortar banking? Is it the death of cash? Uh, do you see a potential uh, UK uh, central bank digital currency? Uh, and how will it transform banking and finance? So maybe wrap that up in 45 seconds. In 45 seconds. Well, it's great to hear from you. That's the first five seconds gone. Look, I think that the first thing that's going to happen is, I mean, banking is never going to be quite the same again, but also what we're going to see is there's going to be a huge financial problem for a lot of the challenger banks who are all at the burn lots of money and try and take over the world stage. So actually banks get a huge breathing space later in the year if they've got any cash whatsoever, because I suspect they can buy a lot of these challenger transaction platforms 
very, very cheaply because they're not going to be able to fund further rounds at higher and ever more giddy valuations. At the same time, it's going to change the landscape of what is banking. It's going to definitely make us a lot more concerned about where we keep our money once again, which was an issue of 2008, which probably plays towards the ultimate thing that banks actually do well, which is being safe. What banks don't play too very well is offering cost-effective cheap services because everything they do is hundreds of basis points and the new challengers are at fractions of a basis point. Now, at the same time, I think it also moves our whole perception on what is really the world of finance and how we want to interact with it. And I think in that respect, some of the places I believe are going to be huge value gainers in the near future are going to be the likes of probably the really, really large global brokerages who've become near banks in their own right. Somebody like Interactive Brokers, for example. So we're going to see an a sort of a digital version of what in 2008 was physicality, because what happened in the banking crisis in 2008, particularly acutely in Germany, what were the banks that saw the biggest inflow of funds during the week after sort of everything was hitting the fan? The answer was it was Daimler Bank, BMW Bank, and in fact, all related finance houses related to the automobile manufacturers. Why? Not because people didn't think there could be a recession, but because people in Munich were able to look out over the stockyards and think, wow, I can see 10,000 Mercedes sitting out there. They've got to be worth something, so I'll get my money out of the bank. I think what's going to happen this time around is people are going to look at very, very well managed entities. And therefore, I think people like interactive brokers with multiple billions of dollars of collateral in the world's markets very well managed are increasingly going to be the places that we will regard as being the safe havens for our money. If that happens to a very large degree, then the banks are ultimately going to find themselves in the same problem as the payment providers because they're simply not going to have as much in reserve, which could slow the growth of the economy down. And let's face it, it's going to be difficult encouraging people to lend in the current environment because we've had 10 years where interest rates have been de facto zero. Mm. Very good. I'm, I'm also kind of curious about um, the skills basis uh, and a couple of questions here. Mar Martin Watkins is on with uh, related questions. Uh, you know, do, do you think that uh, this crisis is going to make people a little bit less dependent on uh, clusters of skills, uh, if, by which I mean geographical clusters of skills? Well, I think what it's going to do is it's going to manage to throw out the fact that people are going to want to have their skills probably diversified as a risk issue. So therefore, you're probably not going to want to have all of your team in one particular part of the world that can suddenly be closed down. And that's going to be a little bit like the epic, you know, the not much discussed episode in SARS, which was that they closed down the epicenter of Vancouver, which a lot of Canadian banks had thought was a great place to have your disaster recovery in the course of, you know, 2002, 2003. And once they closed down your disaster recovery site, actually those banks were under acute pressure because they couldn't move people elsewhere. So I think you've got a similar sort of skills clustering issue. I think the skills issue, thank you for the question, Martin, it's great to hear from you, is absolutely going to be one of digital, 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 digital. You have to be, in this day and age, you have to be either born digital or be what I am, which is bold. You're born analog, you're living digital. If you're not living digital in everything you do at the moment, then you simply do not have the skills to go forward, which now is coming of age, although I appreciate when I first said that with Capital Market Revolution 20 years ago, it took a long time to come to fruition. Well, now we, we're going to touch on a couple of the topics we wanted to cover. Uh, the first one was, of course, uh, DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology, uh, blockchain, if you will, or as uh, we at Zien like to refer to it, smart ledgers, uh, basically uh, super audit trails uh, with uh, and distributed audit trails with a bit of embedded code. Um, now, I don't think we would see in the UK with a forward by Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson, not least because he's uh, just gotten out of hospital. But <laughs> but here you are on a, on a fascinating island. Uh, and uh, one, uh, I think, uh, wouldn't mind you spending a minute uh, helping some of our viewers and listeners understand your thoughts on some of the controversy there uh, with the, uh, the, the, the woman journalist, uh, Daphne, who was... Uh, unfortunately uh, killed a couple of years ago you want to do you want to make a few remarks about what it's like living there uh, as an expat well, look, living here as an expat, first of all, we don't have a vote, so we're not directly involved in the democratic franchise, but we have an incredible opportunity to access government. And that's one of the things which I do think works very, very well, regardless of political party or whether, whether whichever party is in opposition or government. And that's where the DLT book came from. Just to talk about the tragedy of Daphne Caruana Galizia. I mean, clearly, 
a controversial journalist getting murdered is, is absolutely atrocious. It's appalling. It's something which I can remember very clearly from my childhood in Northern Ireland. And not to in any way demean what has gone on there. I think we need to put in perspective the fact that this is an incredibly law-abiding country. It is not something like even Northern Ireland in my, my early years of my childhood. And certainly the murder rate per capita is nowhere near what we're looking at in, say, the top 30 cities in the United States of America. This is an incredibly safe place. But obviously, something has gone on in the corridors of power. We're still working our way through it. There is a judicial inquiry. I would not like to say anything that prejudices that, because actually, the man who is the exalted chairman of the Old Motors Club, of which I'm a member in Malta, is indeed a retired judge who's chairing that process, uh, Michael Malia, and I think he's doing a very, very good job at trying to unearth exactly what has gone on. Obviously, one of the things which took place is that it caused the Prime Minister, by dint of various issues, to resign, and he's been replaced by a new Prime Minister, Robert Abella. And it has therefore, I suppose, caused a bit of a pause to various parts of what was the blockchain island strategy, but that's continuing to go ahead. But clearly it's quite difficult when you're in the business of FDI to get people to come and visit your island when there aren't actually any flights coming in or going out because of perfectly reasonable public health care considerations. Now, one of the things that's uh, fascinating to me is uh, in the heat of this uh, blockchain revolution, uh, that people were, uh, I think, finally coming off of. And uh, as you know, we've we've been participating in it longer, well, even before Bitcoin was around, in the sense of uh, Zien having built various blockchains uh, starting in the, in, the, in the late 90s or mid-90s. I think 95 was our first one. Uh, but what's intriguing to me is that it then blows up massively, uh, obviously because now people see uh, money in it, uh, and I would be curious, uh, we've, you would have thought if you go on kind of where is innovation due to come from, it should have been coming out of London or New York or Silicon Valley or one of these, these great clusters. Uh, and, and, and it did in a way, but it then finds its way to places like Zug and to yep. Malta. Uh, and why is that? Is that accident? Is it tax avoidance? Is it good regulation or is it lack of regulation? What are your thoughts? In some cases, there's clearly a lack of regulation. In some cases, it was very early adopter regulation, which was the case of like Gibraltar, for example, who really took their fund manager law and sort of crossed out fund manager and wrote in distributed assets, which is a, a perfectly reasonable approach, by the way. Malta went a long way down a more comprehensive framework with three different sets of laws, which we don't have time to go into at the moment, but it is pretty much the most comprehensive framework we've seen so far. Now, that gave the first movers some advantage. I don't believe in any case those were related to the tax advantages or anything related to that in Malta. It was simply the fact that a small cabal of people around here suddenly got very interested, which was why we produced the DLT Malta book, because that covers pretty much most of the people who were actually talking about Bitcoin and distributed ledger before the whole boom took off. And in fact, the slide that you're looking at at the moment is, is quite a funny evening, because that was a night in the Meridian Hotel where 14, 15 months after I'd spoken to the Junior Chamber of Commerce all about this whole new digital financial world and about 50 people turned up and I think of those to be sporting, probably a dozen of them really were engaged in the topic of conversation and understood what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you had this meeting taking place within 15 months with 365 people filling the ballroom of the Meridian Hotel. They've been hoping to get 100 people. Now bear in mind, I mean, 365 people, I know their conferences that size in London all the time, but if you do it as an equivalent of a percentage of the overall population, we're talking about easily filling the Emirates Stadium and beyond just on the area of London London itself, not let alone Greater London. So there was a huge explosion of interest. I think now where we've got to is a very interesting bifurcation. You know, we had the question from William asking about central bank digital currency. I think, yes, it's time is coming. I think digital money is going to come and I hope it will be allowed to compete. I'm not sure Libra is such a great idea per se, but I do see competitive money as being a good thing. I said that in Capital Market Revolution in 1999, although I didn't talk about distributed ledgers, which you had been talking about from several years before, Michael. However, what we're at at the moment, I think the most important thing is, I'm not really sure that we haven't passed the peak of Bitcoin. I think, you know, Bitcoin was a great thing. As I talk about in Victory or Death, it was the Model T Ford of the whole cryptocurrency environment. It caused people to go out there, use cryptocurrency, take enthusiastic interest in it, and then people built the apps around it. The Ford Model T, the same thing. People built coffee stores, people started paving the roads in order to get people to go to their particular areas out of time, and that managed to drive a whole ecosystem. 
having driven an ecosystem, I must say I'm struggling to see what the fundamental value of Bitcoin is at this point in time, mm. other than the fact that it's a mathematical algorithm. And as we've discussed before, and I think we're in heated agreement about it, I mean, it's just rather incredibly inefficient as a process of computation, funky as it is. Mm. Interesting. Well, this is not a bad time to turn towards uh, another thing we were interested in. We do have a couple of questions related to this. Um, so people would like your thoughts um, on securities, tokens, and trading platforms, and also the uh, demarcation between ex insurance exchanges and other global exchange groups and large data providers. And lo and behold, we have before us uh, Patrick Young's Pyramid of Exchange. Uh, perhaps you might just like to explain uh, your thoughts on that to the audience, because this is clearly sure. your area of specialty. So Young's Pyramid, it was designed because I spent a great deal of time with particularly buy-side investors and analysts teaching them and explaining to them how the parish of exchanges work. I call it a parish because it's not quite big enough to be a sector per se, so therefore we call it a parish because it's a slightly smaller group. The pyramid works on a very simple basis. I divide up by the valuation of the operating company of each exchange into effectively three tiers. And the top tier has always had three or four companies. This is actually a slightly dated version because we still have Deutsche Börse in the top tier. They now slip back to the point where they're really on the, the cusp between tier one and tier two. They're the top of tier two these days. And we've seen three massive exchanges manage to go forward, which are in order of market capitalization, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Intercontinental Exchange. And those, both of those are very, very heavily oriented towards derivatives, although ICE also owns the New York Stock Exchange. And then you've got the Hong Kong exchanges, which is a huge behemoth of the magnificent epicenter of the financial center of Hong Kong, and also happens to be a gateway into China, which has always helped propel its valuation higher. Then we get to you know this middle group, and they're all what I would call still the department stores. I mean, what is a department store? No one can really define precisely what a department store is, but if they blindfold you and take you inside, whether you're in Selfridges or Neiman Marcus or Harrods or wherever you are in the area of Gallery at Lafayette, for example, you know you're in a department store. And that's what those exchanges that's just are. because the makeup counter is always on the ground floor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Precisely. You know, as, um, as famously a comedian said, you know, you always need to walk in at leotard, leotards and handbags. And then at the bottom step, you have the smaller exchanges. Now, I think that there's been quite a lot of upheaval over this over time, but effectively you're looking at those are businesses that are worth at the absolute maximum about $500 million. And on the cusp of this, you have a couple of department stores, Athens Exchange, which is actually a great business, but unfortunately the country that it's in uh, doesn't really have the economic dynamism to match, unfortunately. And equally the Warsaw Stock Exchange, which is a great business, but obviously in an emerging, dynamic emerging economy nonetheless. And then we go all the way down right through the sort of you know, exchanges that I've run in the past and a lot of alternative platforms and so on. How does that relate to the world of cryptocurrency exchanges and token exchanges? Well, I must admit, I'm really a bit cynical right now about the whole token business. I mean, everybody's running around saying we're going to tokenize things, whereas I think one of the pieces of genius in regulation in the course of the last year has been the UK Financial Cong Conduct Authority. I mean, they've turned around and they've gone, well, hang on a second. Everything we settle in the world of our markets has been dematerialized for essentially 20 years. So therefore, What's the difference between the dematerialized certificate you get from the press, the UK Stock Exchange, and a token? And the answer is nothing. So therefore, they're applying you know, a level playing field of regulation across all these guys. Now, if we start then looking at tokenizing of things, what does that really do for me? I'm not it's actually just sure. a database entry, and you got to be an <laughs> idiot to not think there was a database in the first place. It's, Precisely. It's a lot of garbage jargon being thrown around by people who don't garbage, understand it. Technology. And if we look back to 1999 to 2001, what happened at the top of the dot-com bubble? At that stage, we had this incredibly exciting world of B2B exchanges. It was going to revolutionize wholesale okay. markets, I mean, wholesale power, wholesale productivity. There are two ironies there. One is that if you'd actually been, you know, if you'd locked some and frozen them in aspect and put them in suspended animation for 20 years and woken them up again, first of all, they wouldn't have believed you that the Intercontinental Exchange, which is about the eighth or ninth of those markets at the time, would end up being the biggest exchange or second biggest exchange group in the world and a hugely dominant player. But the other thing was obviously that was Enron and all those guys. What happened to those B2B exchanges? 90% of them went bust. Now, I'm really sorry. I do not wish economic insolvency upon anybody. But at the moment, I do not see what the actual token marketplaces are offering that is going to be 
value additive to the established financial infrastructure. I think some of them will survive, some of them will profit, but the vast majority of tier one crypto exchanges, as has been proven in the course of the last few weeks, they don't have the technology, they don't have the process, and they don't have the ability to manage to master crises because effectively they built their exchanges off what I would say is like a kitchen confidential approach. You know, they've watched those TV programs where Gordon Ramsay runs around and you know, he says, this is rubbish, has a tizzy, says you've got to do, you know, a meter drapes, family style food and have check tablecloths. And then by 28 minutes in after two advertising breaks, you can sit down and everybody's happy and it's all there. And that's sort of like how cryptocurrency exchanges, unfortunately have been built the world over right now. Some of them will survive but a lot of them are going to be dead, and particularly so when we see the revolution taking place, which is the pure digitization of established markets, which renders redundant a lot of the tokenization. Of course, not the use of blockchain, that's a great thing, because that's a database that can be very, very useful, super useful in many circumstances. Yeah. Patrick, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's why I love chatting with you. Uh, anybody who can pull together uh, Kitchen Confidential with, with stock exchanges deserves my admiration. That was a heck of a book. Uh, sadly, he died in the uh, in the last yeah. uh, 18 months or so. Uh, anyway, uh, Chris Pryor Williard and John Fox sort of would like uh, to go up the same direction, as would I, for that matter. Uh, so I'm going to read Chris's out uh, in full. Uh, John mm -hmm. wanted to have a, a look at, you know, have exchanges lost the battle to be where companies raise cash? And uh, that'll be, I think, particularly interesting in light of... Uh, the current COVID issues, uh, but Chris has gone on at uh, some length. To whom should we look for leadership and direction in terms of the new market reality you've described? It cannot be the regulators. The exchanges have gone commercial. And there does not seem to be a natural rallying point uh, to point the stakeholders in the right direction. Uh, and maybe, maybe to some degree, this is why uh, DLT has been seized upon. But you know. Where should we look? And uh, related to another question too, you know, where, where are the innovations going to be coming from? It, it does seem, as you said earlier, it's a bit of a stale field out there. Uh, you know, your top tier have been there, and I would mm -hmm. point people there into the chat section or onto the website where you, on the Zen website where you booked uh, this webinar, you'll find an embedded video and also a link to the video on YouTube. Uh, where Patrick talks about the major exchange mergers is do you like left Twix or right Twix? So, you know, where should we be looking? Where's the action? I think that's very interesting. One of the things which is a disappointment is that obviously quarter on quarter results are driving, I believe, a problem because it's stopping some exchanges from really long-term investment. At the same time, we also have a fundamental problem, and this is why the pyramid exists, because the guys at the top of the pyramid, they can't see what's going on at the bottom. I mean, they're flying their, their jumbo jets or whatever it is, you know, their, their Gulfstream G5s at such a height, they can't see what's going on. And that's a problem for innovation. And they're in, to answer John's question in one, in one very, very simple issue, the exchanges aren't the problem with raising money for capital, the regulators are. If we look at the things that have been put together during the course of, okay, I understand Bernie Evers was a crook, God rest his soul, but the same point, the sorts of rules that were brought in as a result of those issues have made listing in public markets very, very difficult. And that's why I believe we do have to promote crowdfunding, we have to promote an element of private markets, but also public markets as a whole, because public markets are the only way you're going to get all human life involved in investment and allow everybody to be able to save for their pensions and retirement. But we do need leadership at the moment. It's a pity there is no really leading international federation at the top level of the world of, of exchanges these days. There needs to be possibly some extra element whereby people are pushing that. But then it's very difficult because if I'm sitting in the CEO seat of a even say a top 10 exchange at the moment, so I'm a six to $10 billion company at least, I really cannot look all the way down to the bottom to where the innovation needs to take place. And actually that's something we've studied a lot, which is why exchanges go bust, what happens, what they need, how they can be nurtured. And right now there's nobody really managing to push in and lead that. One area where the exchange world has done fabulously well, and I would totally compliment all of the senior CEOs in the business, particularly Adina Friedman of NASDAQ, because she's put her head above the parapet for the last couple of weeks, despite the fact that you know she almost has something to lose in terms of risk because her company supplies 120 something different exchanges worldwide. 
when it came to the threat to close markets over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've ended up with barely a handful of markets, uh, Bangladesh, Amman, Jordan, Palestine, and a couple of other places actually seeing their markets being closed down. And that's been great leadership from the parish of exchanges, and I'm delighted to see it because it helps keep open free markets where people can get a price and they can deal. But to come back to Chris's question, I think there's a problem. There's not necessarily a leadership vacuum at the top end because those guys are doing an incredible data pivot with their exchange businesses. But the simple truth is, if you look at the pyramid of exchanges, people have read the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on that have talked about merger mania. And yes, the top of the pyramid has ended up contracting, but actually at the bottom of the pyramid, it has been widening over the course of the last 10 years quite significantly, even before we take into account the crypto exchanges, the token exchanges, and so on. Why? Because to go back to what I say in Victory or Death, the fundamentally best economic model of the digital age, I believe, is the exchange, and that's proven by the fact that that's the model that's been used for people creating the likes of Airbnb and eBay as much as it's been for the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Hmm. Well, Patrick, uh, you know, it's always great to chat to you. And uh, I think we chatted, uh, fortunately, over the weekend as well. But um, just before we sort of move towards a close, I, I, um, I had a I, I know you're very uh, fond of this saying you know, that uh, this uh, infogram, the, the kind of I want you to succeed, uh, which is just lovely. I like I like a meme generator myself. Uh, but I asked you for what was your biggest suggestion, and uh, you came up with, I thought, a fascinating one. Do you want to share it with the audience? Sure. I mean, everybody's talking about COVID-19. What are the impacts? What's going on? Lots of people are looking for bailouts. I think that's unfortunately simply not going to be feasible, and I don't believe that it actually helps. I suppose I'm a closet chumpetarian apart. But at the same point in time, I mean, I've been involved very closely in the startup community. My wife and I created this thing, Mission to Run Business in Torun, uh, because I've been lucky enough to live at one point in time in my life in both the birthplace of Copernicus, the astronomer, and the birthplace of Cassini, the astronomer. Yeah. And what I say here is I want you to succeed. And the reason I always put this out is because if you spend a huge amount of time in startups, and particularly in Eastern Europe and emerging markets in the world, everybody has this incredible belief that your success, Michael, or my success means that I'm taking you know, a piece of you. And, and it's you know the old Gore Vidal life, you know, oh, as my friends succeed, a lot of their piece of me dies. And I mean, that's okay when you're Gore Vidal and you're a writer because that's a different kind of process. But ultimately, we are in the growth business. And you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. We go at it in different ways, different people. We have our own successes, our own foibles. But I want you to succeed. And I say this all the time when we've been in startup meetings the world over, when I'm giving my IPO videos with uh, Toby the Pug talking about the world of finance, I want you to succeed because I think it's really important that we come at this from a positive growth perspective because your success only means that we can do bigger and better business. And look, how, how better would it be than you know this handsome young man that I met 20 years ago? I didn't realize he was going to be the aldermanic sheriff of the city of London. I mean, look how well you've done, Michael. And, and I think that's great because it's fantastic. And it's a joy to be able to support everybody's business in the world as they go forward and prosper and interact and do business. And that's why I want you to succeed. But your suggestion was an interesting one, wasn't it? That we should prepare for bankruptcy. Prepare for bankruptcy, sorry, yes. The, the whole issue that I think is very, very important here is we really need to get away from the bailout idea and understand businesses are going to go bust, even great businesses that have super ideas, everything like that, because timing is everything we all know, and that can always be a problem. I'm reminded of a, a friend who produced a beautiful single with a dove of peace, and it was going to be the perfect number one song that would unite the United Kingdom, and they released it the week before the Argentines invaded the Falklands. I mean, you know, timing just is everything with what you do. What we need to be doing at the moment, governments, anybody who's out there, please, please, please look at your laws and particularly look at your process as to how you deal with bankruptcy and insolvency. A lot of people are going to enter this now and the best way we can help the next generation of entrepreneurs and the current generation of entrepreneurs to move towards their next business, which will be a success and will pay off whatever they have failed to manage to pay this time around, is by alleviating the bankruptcy and insolvency impediments upon them. And a good example of that actually, Michael, is to look at, you know, compare, say, the Baltic states, compare the Republic of Ireland and compare the United Kingdom. What happened after 2008? A lot of people in the United Kingdom and the United States of America felt 
obviously chastened, obviously upset, but there were processes there that allow you to get out of bankruptcy a lot more easily than effectively some nations which end up wanting you to wear a hair shirt and run around with a handbell shouting fiscally unclean, unclean for the course of five or ten years. That doesn't help the economy. So please, 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 government, do something. Help people go bust. I don't mean encouraging them to do it. Help them when they go bust, help them get out of it again, and let's make a better economy, because indeed, I want you all to succeed. Well, Patrick, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, community's chest, and I, I knew you'd do it, and uh, I've let it overrun by a, a few minutes, because I, I wanted to squeeze that very important thought in about uh, looking at bankruptcy laws. You've brought together uh, things in a, in a great way, uh, not least uh, uh, two of our, uh, of our platinum sponsors, uh, Red Hat, obviously, uh, the entire revolution of DLT is running on uh, very much on the Linux basis, and and of course to have you here uh, as a as a man from Belfast uh, uh, with our sponsor Invest Northern Ireland. Um, so, uh, uh, but it is a thanks to all of our sponsors, and I would just like to end uh, briefly on a bit of a lighter note, a lighter close that you shared with us, uh, Snow White self isolating after coming into contact with Sneezy. Have you, have you just gone down to sneeze yourself? Ah! Oh. I'm going to retrieve Toby because Toby's, Toby's already muscling in on the studio because he knows he's got to start recording in the next 15 minutes for IPO bid. But uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yes, I love I love this Matt cartoon. It's absolutely beautiful. You know, Snow White self isolating. I think Matt is a beautiful cartoonist in the style of some of the best from, say, the New Yorker in history. Lightly amusing, but with a poignant message. Well, Patrick, thanks so much for sharing with us a little bit of your life, and we uh, look forward to perhaps having you again on Communities Chest. It's great to have you as ever. Uh, may I thank uh, our sponsors again and thank the audience and thank you all for your questions, and we uh, hope to see all of you again soon. Take care. Thank you, Michael.